Okay, so I'm going to talk to you uh, about my work over the last five and a half years in Laikipia, Kenya. Uh, this is in central Kenya, uh, where I've used mixed methods to uh, study livelihoods and ecological change. Uh, and so the focus of the study has been on pastoralism, which if you're not familiar with it, you could basically think of this as uh, subsistence herding in contrast to commercial livestock keeping. Uh, but there are a lot of a suite of social characteristics that go along with pastoralism as well that I'll explain in a second. Uh, but really, the the scope of the study was to look at social, political, and eco and economic change uh, across Lycipia and look at how that impact impacts livelihoods as well as the landscape ecological processes of herding. So the impacts of herding on landscapes. Uh, so just to give a little bit of a background on the semi-arid ecology, so uh, it's a semi-arid region. Uh, and can everybody hear me okay? I kind of have a sore throat. You can't actually hear me. Oh. You speak up a little. Okay. I actually have a microphone on to try to move it up. Sorry, I kind of have a sore throat. And, uh, is that better? Is that improved? Okay. I'll try. <laughs> okay, so just to go over this, the the ecology of the region, uh, rainfall really limits productivity. It's the, one of the main factors limiting productivity. And rainfall is highly spatially and temporally variable across the landscape. Uh, so there's a great deal of heterogeneity of vegetation across the landscape. But then also patterns of herbivory fire and soils uh, interact with that rainfall heterogeneity to regulate vegetation and create the patterns that you see in semi-arid lands. Uh, so the, you get the idea of this really patchy landscape with vegetation resources that are important for wildlife and herders alike, and the ability to be mobile in this landscape to be able to buffer that variability is really important. And just to give you an idea of how variable uh, rainfall can be and the implications of it, uh, in this top photo uh, in, in July of 2014, uh, it hadn't rained in about a year, uh, and you can see that the grass is pretty dried out and in, in yellow in this picture. But then uh, nine months later in this middle picture, uh, with very little rainfall over that time period, there's really nothing even resembling a blade of grass anymore. And so with standard ecological methods, you could actually survey this uh, and maybe conclude that it was degraded uh, if you surveyed it during a dry time. But then uh, following uh, about 10 days of rain in this bottom picture, just two months later, there's this nice flush of perennial grass that comes back. Uh, and so these Landscapes are really patchy and heterogeneous, and this is an example of one that's really conspicuous, one patchy place on the landscape that's really conspicuous. And these are actually former cattle pens, where uh, cattle were kept for t 10 to 20 years, typically, in one of these cattle pens, and the manure and urine concentrates in the soil and concentrates resources, and it actually supports an alternative community in this really dense perennial grass and uh, other herbaceous species but woody species tend to not encroach into these areas. So the nutrient deposition maintains it in this state. Uh, and these are really key areas to access for grazing mammals as well. So grazing mammals uh, like cattle, but also like, uh, like other buffalo and other large mammals uh, tend to graze in these areas and reconcentrate nutrients as they spend more time in these areas as well. Okay, and then relating that to pastoralist herding, uh, just to distinguish this from commercial livestock keeping, uh, the focus of pastoralist herding is on specialized breeds of livestock. Uh, it's on, focused on milk production rather than consumptive use of the animals. Uh, the forage resources are typically held in, in common across individuals, so individuals own access to all the resources, but then uh, own the animals individually. So the, the, resources, the grazing resources are held in common, but the animals are held individually. And then there are complex networks of reciprocity. And this can relate to uh, things like sharing herding labor, where people tend to herd together, uh, and also exchange of animals, where people will exchange animals uh, when others lose their animals to sort of help out their friends and family following droughts uh, or, or thefts that people can lose their animals through. And then also is a strategy of sort of balancing risk across the landscape. Uh, through these networks. So if you have your animals more distributed across the landscape and then uh, people lose them in one area, you know, you don't lose all your animals if you have them distributed through, through your friends and family. So my approach is really taking, uh, starting with uh, looking at how vegetation and livelihoods are really tightly coupled in the system, uh, but then using ecological approaches for different elements of of the way that I'm, I'm approaching the study. I have approached the study. So the, 
the ecological perspective that I use is one that's really well suited for understanding heterogeneity of landscapes and also looking at historically contingent changes like nutrient concentrations and things like that across the landscape that can impact vegetation. But then also considering uh, livelihoods and the factors that influence livelihoods uh, at multiple scales across the same landscapes. But uh, there are different factors working on livelihoods that, that regulate livelihoods. So informal and formal institutions. And I'm going to use this word institutions a lot throughout the talk. But basically when I'm saying this, I just mean the rules and norms. So these can be uh, informal and formal rules and norms that uh, can regulate a thing like, like access to grazing. Uh, or it can refer to a thing like reciprocity between where herding labor is shared among individuals. And so then the, the literature that I'm using to frame my dissertation uh, builds off of uh, one, one body of literature that looks at alignment of institutional and ecological scales. So it's really concerned with our uh, different land use norms and rules aligned with ecological processes and are those sort of harmonized together. And then another body of literature that looks at more the political and economic factors that underlie access. So what, uh, what impacts people's differential uh, access to resources across the landscape. And then finally looking at uh, uneven vulnerability to stressors uh, and how this, is, how this is structured differentially among households. So uh, in, in this framing then institutional factors can mediate the way that households access the landscape. Access, uh, and this is access to forage resources across the landscape. So these two interact uh, to, to determine how access occurs. But I'm also including factors like historical material and discursive things that impact institutions and structure institutions in certain ways. So when I say historical factors, I'm referring to things like historical dispossession of land. And material factors can refer to things like uh, une uneven uh, access to cash or uneven employment, uneven wealth. Uh, and then discursive factors, that refers to uh, just the different, different discourses that impact institutions. So this could refer to different understandings of rangeland ecology that are deployed in the way that institutional factors uh, are, are deployed at the landscape scale. Okay, and so then at the household uh, level, the ability to cope uh, and the ability to reduce exposure to a stressor, uh, like for example, drought, uh, that's really a product of household factors interacting with these institutional factors. Okay. And then that ultimately can determine how live, livelihood, can determine livelihood outcomes. And then in the second part of my research that I'll go through, uh, this relates access to forage resources to landscape ecological processes. And so how there's that social structure of landscape ecological process and, and livestock uh, movements, and then how that relates to vegetation shifts. Okay, so the first part I'll kind of emphasize the, the top half of this and then I'll come back to the ecological impacts. Uh, so just a little bit of history on the area uh, where I'm working, where I've been working. Uh, so I've done about a year of field work in one group ranch called Koija that's in like Kipia County. Uh, and I'm just going to give you a little bit of background information on uh, like Kipia County. So in the past it was primarily populated by pastoralists and hunter-gatherers. Uh, in the early 1900s, there were forced removals by the British colonial authority uh, where pastoralists were forced into other areas outside of Lycopia County. Uh, and this was to make way for commercial pastoralism or commercial uh, cattle production by the British colonial authority, not pastoralism. Commercial livestock production by the British colonial authority, uh, really focusing on beef exports at this time. And so in this dark yellow area, uh, there were uh, five groups of hunter-gatherers that were resettled in this area. And then over time, they, uh, they actually intermarried with pastoralist groups and pastoralist livestock keeping became the dominant uh, livelihood practice within these group branches. And then slowly over time, access outside of these areas, outside of this, uh, this area, you could think of it, uh, it's, it was referred to at the time as a, a native reserve, but it's really similar to a Native, Amer native American reservation. Uh, and today it's called Mukagoto Division. Uh, but over time there was decreased movement of cattle outside of this area throughout there. And this led to a livelihood shift where people started to keep more small stock, more sheep and goats. Uh, and so concentration of cattle within this area and then shifts in composition as well. Uh, so today 
uh, these brown areas are primarily uh, uh, private, private land holdings where they're large, large commercial ranches. And uh, over the last 30 years, they've moved more in a direction of having a wildlife conservation focus. So th there's been a shift towards uh, ecotourism on these ranches uh, and really emphasizing uh, wildlife alongside cattle production on these ranches. Uh, and some of them even engaging in research. Uh, and so today, excuse me, uh, and over time, there's been, there's been increasing uh, emphasis on uh, advocating conservation practices within pastoralist group ranches. So, uh, I'm sorry, I skipped over something. Uh, in the 1960s, in post-independence Kenya, there was a policy that emphasized creation of subdivisions within different pastoralist reserves that was intended to uh, encourage uh, commercial beef production within these areas. But that didn't actually happen. Uh, during that area, but the, the boundaries around these individual subdivisions were established. So Koija is an example of one subdivision within what's called Makagoto Division today. So over time, the private ranches have been increasingly engaged in wildlife conservation and have also encouraged uh, pastoralist group ranches to engage in wildlife conservation more. And so this has been uh, really, it's to advocate wildlife corridors throughout these areas in exchange for uh, pastoralist group ranches being more and more involved in ecotourism, gaining proceeds from ecotourism. Uh, but so a number of changes have occurred as a result of these agreements as well between private ranches, wildlife conservation NGOs, and the uh, pastoralist group ranches. So the three of those working together. But there have been changes in governance structure as well as land use changes. And uh, maybe most relevantly to, to this talk is uh, there have been changes in employment and changes in relationships between conservation actors and pastoralists. Okay. Uh, and so I just wanted to point out that the, the location of Makagoto Division along here, this dark yellow area, really aligns with uh, this area of lowest rainfall on the map, uh, as well as the highest amount of co the coefficient of variation of rainfall, which you can just think of that as the amount the, the rainfall can vary within a given year. So a value of 0.4 refers to 40% variation in that value. So 450 millimeters of precipitation, that can vary by up and down by 40%. But this, the location of Makagoto Division really aligned with this rainfall gradient and this area of low productivity for historical reasons, because the British uh, kept cattle and the rest of Lycopia. And this, this area was sort of an area that was set aside uh, and, and people were forcibly resettled there. Uh, okay, and so tracking back to the changes in livelihoods that have occurred over the last 30 years and the more recent changes in livelihoods, at the same time, these changes in uh, livestock husbandry practices have changed. There have been a number of changes in plant composition, and these include uh, changes in tree composition, uh, decreases in perennial grasses and vines, and then also uh, encroachment of several species. And so these are two canopy species that have decreased greatly. So uh, Euphorbia boussier is one canopy species that's decreased as a canopy species, but it still uh, exists in a more juvenile state, but you never see it growing into tall trees more recently. And then uh, Euphorbia tirocali, which has been almost completely extirpated from Koija group ranch. Uh, and so, and then at the same time, there have been two encroaching species of acacia, acacia mellifera and acacia reficiens. Uh, and these have come to dominate large areas of the landscape. Like, I'll, see, I'll show you more about that in the second part of the presentation. Okay, so with that historical context of these vegetation changes and livelihood changes, then the main objectives of my dissertation were to study how social factors are mediating herding practices and impacting the vulnerability of herders to drought. And then the second part is to determ determine the relationship between changes in plant composition and structure and recent changes in herding practices. So linking those two factors together. Actually, okay. And so, sorry, that's cut off a little bit at the top. That says institutional factors at the top. But so the, the way that I framed the first part of my research was to look at how household factors are interacting with institutional factors to mediate access across this group ranch, Koija, where the, the area that I had circled in red within this one group ranch, and how that's shaping access to forage resources. And then how that's uh, impacting 
individual households' ability to buffer drought, the impacts of drought. So I, I began with uh, social science methods, looking at uh, how, basically how people uh, see the changes in their livelihoods that have happened over the last 30 years, and also how they see changes in ecological factors over the last 30 years. So mostly talking to elders in this community uh, that have lived their whole lives in this community. So I began with focus group discussions with groups of elders, talking about the, the broad trends that have occurred, and then using more focused key informant interviews to focus on the really detailed trends that have occurred. And then trying to design surveys where surveys were distributed to all households, and there were different metrics of how, how people's specific land uses have changed. Uh, and yeah, and, and their livelihoods. So land use and livelihood changes were covered in survey instruments. And then used together with the, the more detailed ethnographic data to try to tease out trends in those data across the community, so generalized trends. Uh, so beginning with the more, uh, the more generalized focus group discussions and just the, the changes that have occurred over time. So within Koyja Group Ranch over the last 30 years, uh, there, there were changes where people basically during the wet season use this area within this, this black circle. Uh, and so there are catchments that uh, accumulate water and also forage resources. So during rainy seasons, people are mostly using forage resources within this area, within that inner circle. And then when those resources are exhausted and uh, the, the uh, catchments aren't holding water anymore, then people tend to use this, this wider area within the red circle. And that's the extent of Koja Group Ranch in that red circle. Actually, the border's more like that. But and then in the past, people uh, following exhaustion of these grazing resources and uh, a need to move to, to gain forage, access to new forage resources, people would move out into these surrounding areas. However, that's changed a lot over the last 30 years. And this is, these are the points, so each, based, based on size, these points just represent the number of households that reported in an interview or in a survey that they used a watering point or a forage point there in the past, but they can no longer access it. So these are the change, this sequence of changes that I'm gonna show you are the areas that people lost access to over the last 30 years. So the first change in access was to the, to the west of Mukagoto Division, where private ranches began to exclude pastoralists from these areas. So you see loss to those areas. And then in the 1990s, the changes, here I'll show it again, changes to the east, where uh, due to conflict between other pastoralist groups, these areas were no longer safe for people to go to with their livestock, so people stopped traveling to these areas. <coughs> and then finally, uh, changes in the early 2000s that happened as a result of the wildlife conservation partners that I was talking about, where people entered into uh, private arrangements with uh, wildlife conservation ranches and actually began, began excluding other herders from their, their group ranches. So those areas disappeared. And so there, there are areas that are accessed on the landscape today too that I'll get to in a minute. But I just wanted to show the general trends here that the, the main changes in landscape access around Koija have been due to uh, this restriction from private ranches initially in the 80s, and then changes in conservancy formation, where these are the, the partnerships that I was talking about. And then changes in conflict have also decreased access over time. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, and at the same time these changes in access have, heard, there have occurred, there have been large shifts in livestock composition, where you can see that the cattle have decreased sharply, but at the same time, even more sharply, small stock have increased greatly. And so there's this increase between 2002 and 2016 to that point is especially sheep, and it turns out that this has an ecological basis where there are certain areas on the landscape that are accessed today that have a certain type of grass that if it doesn't have enough rainfall, it doesn't support cattle, but it can support sheep in these areas. So people are emphasizing sheep more recently, but historically up until 2002, people really emphasized goats up until this point. So the sheep have increased more recently. Uh, Okay, and so, sorry. And so at the same time that, that those changes in composition of animals have occurred, there have been changes, and we're back to Koja here with the circle, if that's too obvious. Uh, so at the same time those changes in composition have occurred, there have also been changes in the number of households or homesteads that people have 
Uh, and this is related to a number of factors where this doesn't just represent population growth and splitting of households. This actually represents uh, an increasing fragmentation of households, where in the past people lived in these really large multifamily homesteads together and herded all the livestock together, and it was primarily cattle back then. So people would, uh, there was more reciprocity in uh, herding with the animals, where they were all kept together. Uh, and over time, as people have shifted the small stock more, it's more difficult to herd large herds of uh, small stock together with hundreds of sheep and goats running around, you can imagine. But uh, so people have started to have, have more fragmentation of households, but then also there's been an increasing uh, individualization at the household level where, and what I mean by individualization is that that household is more on its own. So they're not, they're not uh, there's, there's decreased reciprocity with their neighbors, things like that. So those people are more economically on their own and not exchanging animals and not, not collaborating with herding labor. Uh, and then there are some also uh, factors due to just the, the cattle pens and actually keeping small stock in those pens where it's, it's much easier to keep a few hundred cattle, but to make up for the biomass of those cattle in terms of productivity of the animals, that ends up being an overwhelming amount of small stock to keep in a house. Uh, and so back to the access that I was referring to that occurs today still, uh, there are really three types of access that occur when people leave Koija, to go outside of Koija for uh, reserve forage access. And uh, I've been referring to these as informal, formal, and illicit. And informal, uh, this refers to areas that are accessed, uh, that are just open to anyone from Koija. And they're these kind of areas that may have a historical precedence of being accessed, uh, but just you don't really need to uh, secure permission to go to these areas. Just anyone from Koija can go to these areas. But then uh, formal access, this refers to areas that is mostly on private conservation ranches where people either pay to, uh, to have cattle left on the conservation ranches or they uh, arrange through uh, employment, through their employee. They're able to arrange to have their cattle there. And this is for cattle only, this formal access. And then illicit access is pretty self-explanatory. Uh, but these are areas that there's a historical precedent of herders accessing. And recently, they've lost access to these areas. Uh, so from their perspective, this is a legitimate access use that they have. Uh, but even though it's considered illegal under Kenyan law and can, can result in fines. OK, and so then, uh, I'm sorry, I skipped a part. So during a non-drought period, when I was at Koija, uh, there was use of formal access for most cattle. So 86% of the cattle visited formal areas. 86% of the cattle that left Koija. Uh, so two thirds of the cattle remained on Koija, one third left Koija. And out of that one third, 86% of that cattle was located in formal grazing. And only 14% of that cattle that left Koija was in informal grazing. So this wasn't a drought period yet, so there wasn't uh, yet a need for use of illicit grazing at this time, but uh, during drought times, when there's not access available elsewhere, people have to rely on these illicit, illicit access pathways. Uh, and then looking at these patterns of land use during drought, so these are three different wealth categories where I used hierarchical clustering to basically uh, group together into three relatively equal clusters groups of livestock. So within a household, the amount of livestock, it's grouped on composition, but then it also fell out on a gradient where uh, one of them actually, it's, it's actually a low amount of livestock. So the low livestock wealth households tend to have uh, mostly small stock, a few amounts of small stock, and maybe just uh, one or two cows. And then medium households can have several cattle uh, and, and larger herds of small stock. And then the high wealth uh, category can have larger herds of cattle, like up to 170 cattle. Uh, but the, there are really different patterns of uh, land use access during drought times between these, two, these three groups. And you see that uh, there's statistical differences. These are all statistically significant by chi-square analysis, if they have an asterisk at the top. Uh, <coughs> So in, a, in terms of illicit access, you see this pattern of uh, medium, wealth cattle, uh, medium wealth cattle use being really stratified in uh, that they're relying heavily on illicit access. And uh, you see with the high wealth category that they're really relying on private access. 
And so that, that was one point that I left out earlier is that uh, during the, the non-drought season, actually 10 families were mounting for 26% of the, the private land use of the cattle. So just 10 families out of 205 had 26% of that, comp uh, of the, uh, the access to private grazing. And then looking at the patterns between sheep, uh, there's similar patterns where uh, illicit access here in red in the middle uh, is higher for medium wealth households. Uh, and you see that high wealth households are actually more reliant on informal areas during this time. Uh, and, th and this is actually mostly sheep access. So it's, it's, it's the majority of the sheep access that occurs on these uh, high wealth areas because the, the private ranches don't allow sheep, they only allow cattle in these areas. And then uh, looking at the trends, looking at uh, goat, goat access, uh, the low livestock wealth households really have a lot of concentration of goats at home. And then uh, there, there are also statistically significant differences in illicit access where a high and medium wealth herders are more likely to herd their animals off of Koja in illicit areas during drought. And then this, this relates to other assets at the household level as well, this access, the way it's structured. Uh, so high wealth households were much more likely to have an additional house with an additional livestock enclosure uh, within informal areas where they could move their livestock to whenever they needed to during a drought time. Uh, and also owned motorcycles, which are really useful for, uh, for scoping for forage, as well as uh, transporting small animals like baby goats that need to be transported that can't walk to these informal areas. Uh, and then they're also more likely to combine herds and to, uh, into higher additional herders. So they have a, a labor advantage as well as uh, in terms of assets. Uh, and then finally, the, the herding costs, these are just costs that people reported during surveys, uh, the, the patterns of the herding costs that are reported. So you see that the high wealth families are really much more likely to report high, uh, the paid grazing access as a salient cost to them. And then uh, medium wealth families are more likely to emphasize the, uh, the cost of illicit grazing. So this is when uh, co uh, grazing in private, privately owned areas, having to pay a fine. Uh, and then higher wealth families were more likely to emphasize herder payments and food for herders. Okay, and so then there were, there were patterns as well between uh, families that w had a, a family member employed on private conservation ranches versus those that didn't. And those that did have somebody employed on a private con conservation ranch, those households had greater increases in sheep and, and uh, cattle over the, last, uh, over the last 15 year period. I'm sorry, from 2002 to 2013. There's a statistically significant difference in uh, increases in their herds. And at the same time, low livestock wealth families were more likely to report uh, that they were forced to sell livestock and able to buy food. And so this, this sort of relates together is that there's this uh, sort of complex interaction between the need to offtake animals uh, in order to buy grains to, to feed one's family and the ability to buffer that with external access to cash. So those that don't have access to cash really have this sort of offtake on their herds that prevents their herds from growing. And as well, there's, there's the issue of access to forage where those that are employed have greater access to forage resources. So just in summary, to bring that all together, uh, lower livestock wealth families were less likely to leave Koja and had a uh, lack of assets to support mobility from Koja. And medium livestock wealth families uh, had less paid grazing or permitted access <coughs> to neighboring private ranches, but relied much more heavily on illicit grazing and then finally, the higher livestock wealth families uh, have assets and relationships that enable that mobility uh, and also access to cash in those households uh, probably decreases offtake, so increases their herd growth. Oh, yeah. Right, and so how that relates to vulnerability uh, on a community-wide level is that there's increasing vulnerability and precarity for all during droughts because access has dropped off so much for all households. But then uh, in the past, risk would have been shared more among households with households collaborating with, with livestock husbandry practices, with herding and, and sharing of animals. Uh, but today, uh, certain assets 
those without certain assets are less able to maintain access. So there's a selective access on the landscape scale where cert certain herders with assets are able to access resources and others are not. And then cattle herding increasingly depends on access to these private lands, where those who don't have access to private lands seem to not be keeping cattle as frequently. And those without access to conservation ranches uh, depend on illicit areas, especially during drought. So then moving on to ecological methods. Sorry, I'm running over time a little bit. Uh, so uh, the next part was really to focus on how these changes in livestock composition, where there's been fragmentation of ranges and also changes in composition, how that's changed landscape pressure and really concentrated uh, all livestock at the landscape scale, but then also changed the uh, the impact of livestock, where sheep and goats have much different impacts on vegetation than cattle, and to try to tease out these differences. So, but relating that back to this, this framework of livelihoods and access. And so just to remind you of the ecological changes that have occurred, there have been widespread changes in composition where two species have decreased in composition and two others have increased in composition in canopy species. And then there have been decreases in perennial grasses and vines. Uh, an encroachment of several other species. And just to show you this again. Uh, so to contextualize this analysis, I began starting with the, uh, the interviews with elder herders on landscape changes that they had seen throughout their lifetime. So over the last 30 years, uh, what are the types of vegetation that they have recognized in the landscape? And how have they changed? How have they transitioned between different types of vegetation? And then what are the underlying drivers of those changes? And so uh, they're, they're really different uh, perspectives on these ecological changes when you, when you talk to elder herders versus uh, conservation actors, so people on private ranches. They're really contrasting views of those. And on private conservation ranches, when I've talked to people, and just from reading the gray literature, uh, that's really kind of forms the basis of the conservation partnerships. When there's conversation about what's happening on group ranches, it's usually in these terms of that overgrazing is the main problem. There are too many animals, you know, on, on Koija and all the surrounding group ranches. And there's a need for novel management, that management's really the problem, and that structures and, uh, or management practices like rotational grazing are what are really needed to, to fix the situation. But then talking to elder herders and seeing their perspective on the changes that have occurred, there's much more emphasis on uh, drought as a real driving factor of landscape changes uh, in tree canopy species and uh, vines as well as grasses. But grasses is really the most, that's, that's emphasized most frequently, that if rains returned, the grasses would come back. Uh, and then it's emphasized that elephants have decreased tree canopy species. And then usually as a secondary factor, it's emphasized that sometimes sheep and cattle have impacts on regrowth of perennial grasses and that the, the small stock in general can have some impacts on vegetation. So uh, then the, so the, the one methodological challenge that I had was to estimate uh, livestock pressure at the landscape scale. Uh, and so this is usually done using a pyosphere approach where uh, a water point is chosen on the landscape, and then it's assumed that a gradient away from that water point represents a gradient of land use. So you can basically use distance as a proxy for herbivory pressure. Uh, but this is a really com complex landscape with a lot of water points and really heterogeneous vegetation and heterogeneous use. Uh, so I wanted to develop a way to uh, gain a more nuanced uh, understanding of livestock pressure at the landscape scale, and especially at the household level, to be able to generalize across households. And so this graph uh, represents, this is a least cost path, uh, example of a least cost path resistance surface, where when you calculate the least cost path across a resistance surface, it takes the path of lowest resistance, so the lowest cumulative values across, across the surface. So you can see it's not moving through the fives and fours, it's moving through the ones and twos through that to, to gain the, the, the path of least resistance across that landscape. So this is really frequently used in, in wildlife corridor modeling to understand how an organism, a given organism uses a landscape. But uh, working with Nate Niblink on this uh, kind of developed a way to, uh, to predict the way that people are using the landscape with uh, known data, 
between uh, households. These are households on the right, the yellow points, and then red uh, watering points on the left. Uh, so to try to predict which, how, which watering points each household uses. So at each household level, we know like maybe three to 10 watering points that they actually use. But uh, using just distance alone, uh, you could maybe predict the households are gonna use the point that's closest to them. But using a resistance surface, then you can add other information into that prediction to make it a more complex prediction uh, and include other landscape factors. So in that, in that approach, we included uh, homesteads and a buffer around homesteads. And this came from the observation that when people are hurting, they tend to uh, avoid each other's households, uh, the homestead locations. And then also slope, where people tend to use the path of least resistance in terms of slope and go to the areas with the, the least climb, especially with cattle. And then uh, land use designations. So these came out of uh, key informant interviews where people emphasized areas that were typically avoided. And then also surveys where people quantified areas that they avoided because of elephants and other reasons. Uh, so then using these, using these factors, these were incorporated into the model. Uh, and the three layers were combined. So then within each layer, you can have variable weights uh, for the different uh, raster val or resistance values for each theme within each of these layers, and then combine them together into a composite layer where you have variable weights given to all the, all the themes and the overall uh, weight of each individual layer. So the, the final output looks something like this. This is just one candidate example raster. Uh, resistance surface, sorry, I keep saying raster. GIS jargon. Uh, so the, the lighter areas, these have the highest resistance. And you can see that here are the household buffers that are showing highest resistance in these areas. And then the, the darkest areas are those, those are the areas with the lowest slope. There's no uh, restriction in land use. There's no uh, influence of elephant populations in those areas with herding. And so then just varying these values through multiple iterations, so an iterative process and a lot of runs of it, then you uh, create the least cost path from each household to all those watering points. And then in theory, uh, the, the, the best model is gonna be one that actually predicts the, top, the, the few watering point, top few watering points that that household actually uses. So just multiple iterations of that and adjusting, optimizing the resistance surface to try to predict that. And then through the optimization process, you can see that some variables are weighted more highly than others, and others decrease a lot. And then this is just an example of uh, the three composite layers coming together, so slope, avoided areas, and house buffer, how they were weighted in the final model. And then uh, finally, with when that optimal resistance surface is created, do you think kind of gain some improvement on an understanding of the way that people uh, utilize the landscape. Not a complete understanding by any means of the way people understand the landscape, but an improvement based on biosphere approaches. Uh, then through combining each household with the known watering points that are used, then using the least cost path algorithm, you can determine the path of least resistance to that watering point and model a <coughs> corridor that that's based on the likelihood that people are gonna be using that area of the landscape. And this, this output is a composite of all the households across Koja and their, their uh, livestock paths to different watering points. So the, the areas with darker red, that, that symbolizes a lot of households that are overlapping in those areas. So you've got high intensity of land use in those areas. Uh, and so then, then we sampled, uh, based on dung counts, we estimated go go uh, presence across the landscape uh, and compare that just to be able to sort of judge the predictive ability of the model. And you can see with the Piosphere approach where the watering points are, are weighted by frequency of use, this is just the kind of standard rangeland ecology way of looking at this. Uh, there's not a very strong correlation to go, go pressure the way that we measured it on the landscape. And, but then if you compare our, our model, the, uh, the model using the corridors, uh, there's, there's a pretty, uh, pretty large improvement in the predictive ability. I mean, it's not, we didn't expect it to be able to predict this with a much higher R squared value, but the fact that it is significant shows a great improvement over the Piosphere model and ability to predict this really nuanced landscape use.
Okay, so then just in, in summary of that section, we use household surveys and least cost, path cor least cost corridors to model uh, livestock pressure at the landscape scale. So then the, the objective was to compare that to vegetation changes over time. And so then this part of the study, we use remote, remotely sensed images uh, and combine these with uh, herder accounts of vegetation changes over time to train the images in the past. So there are vegetation types that existed in the past that don't exist today. And talking to herders and then looking at uh, historical air photos, we're able to verify the types of vegetation that existed in the past. And so this is a forest of Euphorbia tiricale on the left that was uh, present in the late 70s and early 80s uh, that's no longer there today. And there's actually very few individuals anywhere on the landscape. Uh, it's very rare to find Euphorbia tiricale. It is in surrounding areas, but completely extirpated from Koja. Uh, and then there are two areas shown here where uh, these represent former uh, really dense gra perennial grasses in these areas, and today have experienced a lot of shrub encroachment in, into these areas, acacia mellifera and acacia reficiens in these areas. And then uh, this is uh, an area where uh, Euphorbia boussier was formerly a canopy species, and today uh, there's no canopy species there today. And then in another area, you can see that this is a, uh, this is a former grazing lawn on the left, uh, where it was really dense perennial grass in the past, uh, and a site of a really large livestock enclosure in the past. But today, you can see that it's increasingly bare in this area. Like the, sorry, the, uh, it's a lighter color, which shows reflectance of the soil. So it's showing more bare soil in this area. But then we were able to use these historical photos to train Landsat satellite data. So using the, the archive of historical Landsat data, going back to the 1980s, uh, we're able to train these images to, to classify them and break them into vegetation classes. And I'm not going to go into the details of this analysis, but we're able to uh, pull together classifications, categorical classifications from 1987 and 2013, and then look at changes between these classes. And so the sort of standard way of analyzing these changes would be to do a transition probability matrix where you're looking at the percentage of one class on the left uh, what's the chance that it's going to change into this other type of vegetation? But that's really difficult to compare to the, the herbivory output that we have, the, the herbivory gradient that we've estimated at the landscape scale. So we use these categorical classifications together with a continuous understanding of vegetation difference. And so uh, a lot of you are probably familiar with this uh, NDVI, the Normalized Difference in Vegetation Index. But this is based on the relationship between red and near-infrared bands. I'll just leave it at that for now, because uh, I'm trying to go fast. But then looking at the difference between these two bands over time. So subtracting that value in 2013 from the value in 1987, and looking at the difference. So that's a continuous metric of difference over time, where if you've got a high value in 2013, then that will result in a low value of change over here. If you had a high value in 1987 and 2013, that's going to be a low amount of change. But if you have a high value in 1987 and then a low value in 2013, that will be a, a positive amount of change. So just keep that in mind. It's a little bit confusing. And then as another metric of continuous change uh, to <coughs> sort of add to the NDVI, which NDVI basically you could think of it as representing biomass so, or productivity. Uh, in vegetation transitions, but to gain more information about those vegetation transitions, we use principal components analysis where all six bands from both satellite scenes were combined, and then principal components analysis is a way of basically reducing data down, so gaining the, the, uh, the dominant trends in a data set. Uh, so reducing that down to three, three variables and the output from the principal components. And this represented 90% of the variation from these three values. But we chose to use principal component one because it had the most difference from NDVI, where principal component two and three were really closely correlated to NDVI. And then compared these, uh, these changes in plant community composition over time, bringing that back to compare it to uh, our livestock estimations across the landscape scale. So we had these for. Uh, Small stock, which are herded together, that's sheep and goats together during the wet season and dry season, and then cattle uh, during wet and dry seasons. 
and then use the linear model to look at the changes uh, while controlling. So the, the dependent variables were NDVI and principal components analysis. And then the independent variables were herbivory, uh, the, the modeled, her the estimated herbivory pressure. But then we included environmental variables to control for other uh, landscape factors that might be actually uh, correlated with those livestock ranges uh, to be sure that we were distinguishing environmental gradients from livestock gradients. Uh, and then, actually, sorry, I left out of here. That then we did this within each class for 1987 each 1987 vegetation class. So you're beginning with the, uh, the beginning state in 1987 and then looking at continuous change over time in relation to herbivore pressure. Uh, and finally, there was a spatial error term included in that model if spatial autocorrelation was detected. So either use the spatial lag model or a spatial error model, uh, depending on the type of autocorrelation. Okay, and so I, out of these, uh, linear models for each vegetation class. There were really four types that had, had uh, the largest trends. And so these were above uh, R-squared values of 0.15. Uh, and out of 37 types, there were four types that had a vegetation, uh, that had a correlation to livestock herbivory. And so this first one is a correlation between uh, shrub, shrub and grass cover and dry season cattle pressure estimates. And you can see in principal component one, there is a, a negative uh, relationship with increasing livestock pressure. And so this probably represents a change in productivity and it, it could represent a change in composition as well uh, over time. So this is probably reflects an impact on perennial grasses of cattle during dry season impacting perennial grasses. So a decrease in composition or decrease in productivity, but also correlated changes in composition. Uh, and so then looking at uh, area that was formerly dense euphorbia species, so this is multiple euphorbia species growing together, a lot of vines in this area, uh, and with the grassy understory. There's also this impact of dry season cattle pressure where you see a little bit steeper of a relationship there with an R-squared squared value of 0.28. And then the next two relationships are both to small stock where areas with shrub and vine densities were impacted, showed a correlation between small stock density estimates and decreases in shrub, shrub and vine cover. Uh, and this is probably related to goats that are, are browsing in these areas rather than sheep. Uh, and this is actually, you could think of it as the same way. This is the one that I said was counterintuitive where the NDVI is increasing, but actually that represents a decrease in productivity over time. Uh, so. Out of, out of all these changes, just bringing all those changes, the remotely sensed changes together, uh, 12 out of 37 of these past vegetation types had no correlation to livestock pressure that was above point, point 0.10. And correlations between dry season cattle pressure estimates and decreasing grass cover, there were two of these, cor uh, two of these vegetation types that did show a correlation. Uh, and then small stock pressure, there was also two correlations between vegetation types and then no correlations overall between loss of canopy uh, or encroaching shrub species. So really just four dominant changes that were related to, that were correlated to livestock. Then just for a final set of methods, uh, we used plot-based plot analysis to look at these herbivory gradients in relation to species composition on the ground today, and two areas that were thought to have experienced uh, similar past vegetation, or the, were thought to have historically been similar types of vegetation. So, and these are grazing line communities as well as hilltops areas where uh, we looked at the species composition within plots. And uh, two, two species that are thought to be encroaching had correlations to livestock uh, densities where this is Sansevieria volkensii uh, that's known to be an encroaching species that within grazing line communities, it's been shown to actually increase where, uh, where cattle ranges are higher, the, the cattle estimates are higher. And then secondly, uh, bare areas actually increased in areas with increased small stock. <coughs> and an, another species, Solanum incanum, which is known to be uh, an encroaching species in areas with a, lot of, with a high cattle density. This is actually shown to be correlated to higher, higher cattle densities in these areas. But Overall, there, there were changes correlated with livestock density, but 
livestock, uh, at least this analysis doesn't indicate that livestock is having a primarily a primary role in shaping the community composition of these vegetation types. And their correlations have changed in decreasing productivity and increases in two encroaching species. But overall, the, the changes in composition are not related to livestock pressure, at least from this analysis. So both the remote sensing analysis and this plot-based analysis uh, indicates to more complex drivers of vegetation change. So in terms of drought, elephants, and fire suppression, all interacting together. These are, these are factors that we didn't include in the model, but basically these results indicate that there's something more complex going on here than livestock pressure alone that's driving these changes. Uh, and I have a hunch that it's related to drought uh, and the sensitivity of vegetation to drought, uh, or the sensitivity of vegetation to livestock pressure during times of drought. So the vegetation is really sensitive at that point, but that's not something that we could detect with these with this way of looking at landscape pressure. Uh, and so then interactions between drought and livestock pressure require future study. Okay, so then to emphasize what's integrative about this work, uh, so we've been able to use, use ethnographic methods alongside ecological methods to understand how the social context uh, has driven local changes in livestock pressures, and then use uh, surveys to create improved estimates of livestock pressure at this really local scale within one group branch. And then use elder accounts as well uh, to interpret vegetation transitions and contrast the different views of different actors in this landscape and how they interpret ecological change. Okay, and so then just zooming out on everything uh, that I presented, the social and ecological methods, uh, there's been increasing stratification of livelihoods uh, and increasing stratification of vulnerabilities that relate to loss of access and that access becoming more and more selective. And then there also being uneven impacts of droughts at the household level between droughts. Uh, and so this really uh, reflects a, what, what I interpret as a scale mismatch where the institutions have become aligned with wildlife conservation. So the institutions really uh, are set up to ensure that wildlife corridors can occur and that wildlife conservation uh, is sustainable in this landscape. But at the same time, it's excluded pastoralists herding ecology from the, uh, the institutional landscape. Uh, and so that also works together with, there's, there seems to be a disconnect between management narratives where there's this continued focus on reducing stocking rates and uh, management within static boundaries on group ranches uh, but at the same time, leaving out of the picture this historical fragmentation of herding ecology, of the, the ranges that people could use in the past, uh, and livestock species changes over time. And so then, just finally bringing together, I think that there's a, a way forward in this conversation to really change the conversation when you talk about the contrasting views of ecological change uh, and livelihoods uh, to, to really uh, emphasize new conservation practices, you know, new possibilities for conservation practices in these areas. Okay, and just finally, I wanted to thank uh, especially uh, Naptari Paul Washira, who was, worked really closely with me on a lot of this work uh, at Koija, did all of the, the interviews and transcription uh, throughout, and then Naptari Lelakung, who's in this tree, looking for elephants while we're doing vegetation surveys. <laughs> it's a really tall tree, it's actually only the top half of it. Uh, yeah, and then Parsaroy Kalal and uh, Anthony uh, Parsaroy, who actually I left off of here as an oversight. And then my committee members, uh, thank you so much. And uh, yeah, thanks to Nate Nibling for all his help with the, the uh, least cost corridor model. And uh, Tom Preble as well is here, who really helped me out like getting this finished up in the last minute with Python code. Uh, and Deepak Mishra, who gave me really great advice on, uh, on remote sensing analysis. And then Walker Depew and Emily Horton, who gave me great feedback throughout throughout the process of designing this research and carrying it out. And thanks. I'll take any questions that you have. <laughs> Sorry I ran over. Really nice. Thank you. Thank you. Um, oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah no. uh, kind of a clarification question. First of all, very interesting um, work. I liked a lot. And, uh, some of your graphs earlier on, you had salt 
in there? Yeah. Um, was that, and then medicine. And I was just wondering what those were. They seemed really high. And were those for human consumption? or? Were no, that's for livestock use. For livestock yeah, use. yeah. So there's... Let me go back to that, actually. But I didn't, I didn't emphasize them because there wasn't a difference between the wealth categories, but they were just a characteristic that everybody tended to emphasize. Uh, yeah, so salt and medicine, it's, it's really, uh, that's one thing that I glossed over a lot of things in this talk, just it's hard to squeeze it into an hour, but uh, disease risk is really an uh, important factor and it interacts with drought uh, at the landscape scale too where when people have to move during drought they actually are exposing themselves to more disease. Uh, so a lot of people that leave during droughts have a lot of deaths in their livestock because of medicine. But, but there, weren't, there weren't differences in the, this is just the cost of people reporting it as a saline cost because the medicine is so expensive and salt is just something that everybody has to buy. So sorry. Yeah, Laura. Yeah, um, question. I, so I think of your work as someone from ICON who has pushed uh, the push further than many in terms of your integration, your theoretical integration across different lenses. Um, but you spent most of your talk talk uh, focusing on method. Yeah. So I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, your experience with integrating theory. Sure. And um, any advice you have for others in the room or uh, productive um, conversations of that forced uh, across boundaries? Yeah, definitely. And that's, that's something that it was just one of those slides that ended up getting cut where it's talking about the theoretical framing and already being over time. But, uh, so in bringing theory together, uh, what I came across pretty early on in ICON was uh, were two distinct bodies of work where one uh, you could call social ecological systems where it's kind of like looked at multiple scales of, of uh, resource use and also looking at social elements as well. But it's really sort of skewed towards the ecological perspective just in the, the whole history of the discipline. And so I uh, spent a lot of work trying to combine it with other disciplines that added uh, different elements like there's there's a really uh, sort of conspicuous lack of being able to grapple with questions of power and inequality in social ecological systems and other uh, more critical social science perspectives like political ecology can really add on to that uh, and really get at aspects that it's that social ecological systems can miss on but I found that using those two uh, side by side and kind of like letting them uh, create tension between each other led to a lot of uh, insight and just more interesting questions to ask about uh, historical changes, you know, inequality of changes. And uh, I don't know, but it was really, uh, it was more just like a process of muddling through with that too, you know, in a way that I think everybody has to cater that to their own work. So I feel like with my, my research, I felt like it was actually easy to be more integrative than other people that I've seen their research just because of the question because it's so it's so tightly coupled the way that ecological and uh, livelihood factors are coupled together that it kind of it kind of demands you take an approach that's uh, really interdisciplinary in a lot of ways but I think other people it's it's harder to find those overlaps does that answer your question yeah it does I, um, I, I was just struck by your failure I don't even think you said the word political ecology when you're <laughs> well, that, yeah, I was trying to squeeze so much um, in and that it was like... It seems like you're, I mean, maybe this is um, just because that's kind of the side that I'm more steep in, but it almost seems like your entire uh, analysis of vegetation change is driven by more critical questions, which may not yeah. be clear to people in the room. And, um, and that's quite fascinating, right, because that wouldn't typically be the case. So I just wanted to highlight those, those aspects. Yeah, definitely. I, I, I definitely intentionally made it more subtle for this talk. You know, then. <laughs> <laughs> so that we'd pass you, or at least. No, 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 not because of that. <laughs> not because of that, just because there's so much to unpack yeah. when, when you bring up critical social science that I felt like I just couldn't, I would just do it a disservice to try to talk about it in one slide. And, you know, so it wasn't like that I was avoiding it or anything. <laughs> no, no, it's okay. It's okay. <laughs>
No. And it be with a worn out audience too. You know, it's like I I haven't actually talked mostly when I've given talks I've talked about the more critical stuff, actually <laughs> like in icon talks and things like that. So I wanted to emphasize the ecology. And this is the first talk I've given where the ecology's all been brought together as well. So Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, Emily. Yeah, this, this graph? No, it was like you actually went through it and like removed the spots over Oh, yeah, yeah, these, these graphs. That, yeah. and I thought that was fascinating because that makes me think too about like in the fisheries context, I could see this kind of model of thinking being applied to like other contexts. Um, and this is a massive question, so totally. Um, but in your mind, have you kind of started developing an idea of how you're seeing, and maybe you, you explained that and I just missed it, um, this lack, this decreasing, decreasing access to these areas of the time, seeing them being linked to conservation, privatization, um, and conflict. How in your head have you been seeing these linked together, um, or those relationships? I know it's really have, complex, and then what does that tell us about that landscape change over time, or do you see relationships there? Yeah, sure. They're they're huge relationships, and that's that's another thing that is more on the the critical side that I kind of glossed over, is that uh, so a lot of the the private ranches are over on this side, and uh, really wrapped up in the changes in conservation access have been uh, their interests in securing securing land, you know, having having a uh, leverage against challenges to their their claims to ownership because the, this land is based on. 99-year uh, leases that were signed when the, the British colonial authority signed them with the Maasai, uh, you know, a uh, hundred years ago. And these, there's, there's a real uh, concern from private landowners that they're going to lose their land someday. And that's actually been a really contentious issue this past year where there were massive walk-ons onto these private ranches. So the, uh, really, th I, I see the conservancy plan as a way of managing the landscape. Uh, on, on behalf of conservation interests. And it's not that they're not interested in conservation, they, but they also want to protect their, their, uh, their right to the land. So in entering into these partnerships, they actually create, are trying to create a more stable landscape for themselves. So they're, they're looking after their own interests in a way too. And then conflicts, uh, so not these specific conflicts, these are related to wider conflicts, but uh, there's actually a risk for increasing conflict uh, that's being seen as a result of conservancy formation, where people aren't able to move around the landscape as much, and it's creating new struggles over, over access to land. That's probably gonna drive future conflicts, I would think. And we, we've seen it in the last year. Uh, does that answer your question? Yeah, it was just, it was just, I just thought that was really neat. Um, so just cool. Yeah, Aaron? Um, speaking of conflicts, and, and you mentioned um, herders, accessing illegal lands and, and things like that. And I was thinking about and, and bringing the conservation side of the question in. Um, did the issue of poaching come up much? Like, are herders reporting poaching? Are they um, being paid by the conservation ranges to report poaching? Do they know poachers? Are, are any of the people in that community being recruited into Coming poachers. Did that come up at all in any of the interviews? So it, it's actually part of the, the sort of wider uh, like landscape connectivity for conservation planning is one of the one of the things that goes along with that is that scouts are frequently hired within communities, and one of their jobs is to report uh, you know hunting or uh, or e e I mean poaching is a really loaded term, so I'm kind of hesitant to use it because it's been used to, to demonize hunting so often in, in Africa. But, there, but there, there are big game poachers that aren't from this area that come into this area and will hunt elephants, you know, just strictly for, to export the tusks. Uh, but part of the conservation incentives have been to create a more securitized landscape. So they really provide vehicles, train guards, and uh, sort of have, have more of a presence of these, they call them scouts. And then there's uh, the other, uh, I'm drawing a blank on them, the, the, the Nibunga guards as well. 
And, and then uh, Northern Rangelands Trust is really active to the north of this area. And actually, they're, they're, they're present in this area as well. But they're really emphasizing uh, security of the landscape. And uh, so it's, it's really a contentious issue, though, because there, there are elephants killed sometimes. And African wildlife, uh, or I'm sorry, the, uh, I'm drawing a blank. The government, government wildlife enforcement will come in and be pretty heavy handed with people. So they'll be quite violent in communities if an elephant gets killed, basically until someone turns over tusks. So, but it, it tends to not happen that frequently. But there is, there is conflict between people and elephants for sure too, that can kind of uh, border on that as well, where you know, people will, there's, there's a lot of human wildlife conflict between people and elephants. Uh, sorry, that was kind of all over the place. But that, so the people in that community are actually being recruited into illegal hunting, but they're being employed to act as scouts and, and more through that avenue? Yeah, through conservation organizations. They work as scouts that are charged with reporting uh, grazing and go, er, reporting, uh, reporting poaching and going after poachers in these areas. Any other questions? Yeah, David. That was that was quite clear. I was curious in the array of different uh, methods that you were using and model approaches. Um, if there were other things that emerged from those interviews, from your conversations, that you feel like you could have included in the model, and or uh, some surprising elements that you might not have included without having that sort of the, the ethnographic aspect. Yeah, definitely. That's a great question, David. Uh, it was. So one of, the, one of the factors that really I would have liked to include it in the model is, you know, there's, so from doing participant observation, going herding with people, and also people emphasizing sort of uh, the patchy places that they emphasize on the landscape, there's this uh, like kind of daily selection on places that people emphasize in the landscape. And this model just completely glosses that over. It completely misses that. But it would have been really, uh, you know, I think this is a way to lay the, the ground for a first step towards doing something like that. But there are possibilities to do that with something like agent-based modeling, where you could also include factors like that. Uh, and then there are other factors that I think just you couldn't incorporate into this model that I know that are really important for herding. You know, just like there's like a sociality of herding. You know, people just like, especially kids will, when they're out herding, they'll hang out in the same place and hang out and talk, you know, and just kind of congregate in certain areas. And I think that would be really difficult to model or include in something like this. And then, uh, yeah, I think there are other ways that you could incorporate the vegetation resources too, like using remote sensing, actually incorporating it into the model. But I didn't do that because then the, uh, those, those vegetation changes would then be, uh, you know, they'd be collinear to the vegetation change detection part that I was trying to do. So bringing those together would be inappropriate. But you could do that to try to understand the way that people are using the landscape specifically. Uh, but yeah, I, I was surprised uh, to learn that there were, there were places that people frequently avoided because of elephants. You know, and that's, that's something that would have never been in the model otherwise. Uh, yeah, and so the, the slope and household buffers, those were just kind of things that were like observed. But all the other land uses in the, that, that land use model, those came out of the ethnographic data, the, uh, the land use designations. But, yeah. Yeah, really yeah, I think so. And it was, you know, it was kind of a methods-based approach. 
you know, so it wasn't really tied into the, the theory, but it kind of emerged from doing this interdisciplinary work. You know, it was just like, oh, wow, you know, like, we could do this with this data. You know, it just kind of came out of it. And so, yeah. Kind of yes. Cool. Thanks, Dave. Any other questions? Yeah, John. Clarification question about the, um, uh, the <coughs> tracing pressure uh, kind of model you made with the connection, the whatever you call it. Um, but that's based on like current stuff. Were you able to make make that longitudinal, or would that be possible? To like, because there has been a lot of change in access and things like that. And so yeah. it sounds like you're kind of correlating the vegetation change with kind of current grades. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay, no, so that's really uh, a good that point. Mean, yeah, and that was that was my original goal. Where, if you know the uh, the distributions of households that I showed earlier, so I did interviews where I talked to people about the places that people used in the past. You know, when households were based here, and the changes in access that have occurred. But then there have also been changes in. Uh, so that, that's in the 80s, right, when people were living in completely different places and really just used a few watering points at the river that people walked down. So, and it was mostly cattle and it was all really focused on this side of the group ranch. But then uh, also during the 2000s, as a result of, uh, of conservation uh, partnerships, this area was designated a conservation area. So there are actually watering points located along here that people no longer use anymore. But prior to 2002, they would have used them. So that was something that if I hadn't run out of time, basically, and you know, been so things be so tight finishing up, that I, I'd wanted to include in the model. But I still could do, eventually, to have a more longitudinal. You know, so then you could look at pressure in the 1980s, and then look at pressure through the 1990s. Uh, and then as the land use arrangements changed, you know, look at the impact of those different conservation uh, policies, you know, and just how that changed land, land use pressure. Because there, especially around this area, there was a time when you had people completely avoiding this area. Uh, and so th I have data on, on which watering points they would have used before that. So that's something that's that'd be possible to look at. But yeah. Thanks. Also in some of the ethnographic data as well as some of the other places. There. What's that? Yeah. Some of that's in the ethnographic data that you already collected. Yeah, yeah, it's from survey data. So households reported areas that they would have used before the conservation agreement. So go back and look at that. All right, well, we get to move on to the next part of the afternoon. <coughs> thank all of you for coming. Let's thank Brian. Thank you.